Well, the Gonzaga Bulldogs are 2-0 and after a hard-fought come-from-behind victory over the Michigan State Spartans on Friday evening. Let's discuss the good, the bad, and oh boy, the ugly, right here on the Locked on Zags podcast. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I am your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you daily reports through another season of Gonzaga basketball. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Sling TV. Don't miss this week's matchup between Gonzaga and Texas right here on Sling. Sling, the TV you love for a price you'll love. Try it today. All right, this is a reminder for most of you, but today is... Mailbag Monday, we are discussing all things Michigan State, we're discussing Hunter Salas playing point guard, we're discussing Gloria Navarez and her departure from the WCC to the Mountain West, a jam, jam jam-packed episode today. If you want to get involved in Mailbag Monday and you have not done so yet, you can email me at andypatton013 at gmail.com whenever you are thinking of a question. You can also reach out to me on Twitter at andypattoncbb or at LockedOnZags. Finally, I also post a tweet on Sunday morning soliciting questions. You can respond to that tweet to ensure that your question gets answered in the show. All right, tons to talk about today, so we're just going to get straight into it. This first question comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, how does Gonzaga's performance against Michigan State go to defeat the argument that Gonzaga is a soft team? Gonzaga just took an extremely tough and physical shot from the Spartans, and in the second half, the Zags were simply tougher and more physical than one of the toughest and most physical teams in all of college basketball. Or is this an argument that will not be truly settled until the Zags cut down the nets as national champions in March or April? (laughs) To be honest, I'm not sure that people would stop calling Gonzaga soft, even if they won a national championship. Not really here or there, but a fact. I think the goalposts have continued to be moved and moved and moved and moved every single time that people talk about Gonzaga. And I think them winning a national championship would shut a lot of people up. But ultimately, I think that we would still hear some of that stuff. I'd also push back a little bit. Excuse me, Michigan State is a tough team. They are a physical team. I'm not sure that they are one of the toughest and most physical teams. Gonzaga is playing other teams that are going to be more tough, more physical. Baylor uh, strikes me as a team that's going to be even more of a challenge in that regard. Uh, Texas uh, coming up very soon, uh, depending on what how Chris Beard kind of attacks Gonzaga defensively. I think it'll be interesting, but they have some bodies. They have some toughness as well. Uh, this game ended up being a really tough and physical game because of the situation. And this is going to come up a lot in this podcast. And it has come up a lot in conversations around this game, but the situ- the circumstances were just so different. Michigan state has, has played in an environment like this before they've played on an aircraft carrier. Tom Izzo, excellent coach, had a game plan. His players executed it very well in the first half to really prevent Gonzaga from doing anything in the paint. Gonzaga's ball screens actions just were not working. They were not able to get anything outside of outside shots. Uh, I do think Gonzaga obviously responded extraordinarily well to come back to win that game when being down as much as they were in the first half, even in the early parts of the second half is a really strong testament to the just pure talent that is on this team, the pure talent that is Drew Timmy, uh, the talent of, of Mark Few to kind of make some of those adjustments and, and find a way to win this basketball game. I'm not sure how much it really settles about this team. We're two games into the season and this game was a really, really difficult one to really glean a lot of information about the team just because of the weird circumstances. But I've always thought that Gonzaga is more tough than teams and other fans give them credit for. And pulling out a victory in a game like this certainly helps uh, to kind of prove that point true. Next question comes from John via Gmail. John says, Timmy Strother and Bolton should pace the team in scoring, but who do you think will be that fourth or fifth good consistent score? A lot of teams don't have five consistent scores, so expecting that from Gonzaga or any team is, is a bit tough. Having said that, to me, very clearly, the fourth best score on this team or a player who could conceivably challenge to be a top three scorer on this team is Malachi Smith. Malachi Smith had 15 points in Gonzaga's first game against North Florida. He had a very good game uh, against Michigan State. He wasn't exceptional scoring the basketball necessarily, but really good defensively, did some really nice stuff uh, on both ends of the floor. He's a tough player. He's a physical player. Uh, He's still kind of 
figuring out how to play at this level, obviously coming from the SoCon and from Chattanooga, there's a bit of an adjustment and also being a high usage player, the way that he was with the mocks to being a guy who's not even starting, who's again, fourth, fifth scoring option. Uh, when he's on the floor, he's probably third or fourth most of the time. So it's an adjustment. And I think we'll see him continue to get more comfortable in the offense as he just adjusts to his new teammates and his new situation and his new role. Uh, but to me, he's going to be one of Gonzaga's top five scores. And there's a very real chance that he challenges Bolton and Strother for just total points per game, at least. Uh, he may not be one of the most effective players. Like those guys might be top three players on the team, but he's going to challenge in that spot there. Number five is going to be, I think, a rotating spot. I don't think they're going to have a really consistent top five scores game in and game out. I think there will be games where it's Nolan Hickman. We saw glimpses from him uh, in this contest, but we also saw kind of some of the bad sides of Nolan Hickman. And we're going to talk more about that in some later questions. But uh, I think Hunter Salas could come could be in, in conversations there. I think Anton Watson has proven that he's going to play 20 to 25 minutes per game. He's not an elite scorer. He has never been an elite scorer. He's never really been asked to be an elite scorer, but just by virtue of playing enough minutes and being a guy who can get out and transition and, and get some takeaways. I think he's going to be a guy who scores eight to 10 points per game, which might be enough for him to be Gonzaga's fifth score. Next question comes from Mike at Miller, Mike one, two, three on Twitter, who says, what are the odds Gonzaga is the number one week, number one team the week of Thanksgiving. They have the potential for quality wins over Texas and Kentucky while North Carolina won't have any and hasn't exactly looked convincing. Yeah. North Carolina hasn't looked great to be perfectly honest, in their first few games of the season. I've, neither has Gonzaga, so it's kind of been an interesting kind of dynamic to see both those teams struggle a little bit uh, towards the top. Uh, the early parts of college basketball season tends to be a little bit wonky for a lot of teams. It's part of the reason that there aren't a lot of very marquee matchups early in the college basketball season. Uh, for North Carolina, though, the fact that they are returning the vast majority of their big time contributors from last year's team and adding a player like Pete Nance and, and the caliber of, of performer that he is, you would hope that they'd be a little bit kind of more ironed out early in the year. Having said that, I'm not sure Gonzaga is going to get the number one seed by the, the number one ranking by Thanksgiving. For starters, they have to beat Texas and Kentucky in order to be in that conversation. That is not a guarantee. It is not even close to a guarantee. It may not even be over 50% in my mind that they're going to win both of those games. It's probably in the 40, maybe 50 ish range percent that they win both those games. And even if they do, I don't know that they take over North Carolina. North Carolina might have to lose for Gonzaga to move into the number one spot. I understand the argument that Gonzaga with wins over Michigan State, Texas, Kentucky should be higher than a North Carolina team that wouldn't have wins there. And if that ends up being the reality, we can absolutely have that conversation then. But for now, any the Zags have two really, really big games that they need to win. I'm sure that's all they're focused on, and I'm sure that that's all that really kind of matters to, to them before we get to that point. Next question, final one of the first segment comes from John via Gmail. John says, what will be Gonzaga's record after the non-conference season is over? Yeah, I've answered this a couple of times, and quite frankly, the result against Michigan State hasn't changed my answer. It didn't. Yes, they didn't look particularly good in the first half. There was there there some of the the concerns coming into the season for Gonzaga have continued to be there, which is not great. You would like to see some of those concerns, namely how they switch on screens and the ability to to prevent guards from getting into the lane very easily. That's something we saw rear its ugly head a lot in the first half against Michigan State. Uh, it's something that regardless of what the surface that they're playing on, I don't think that that's relevant. That's still something that they're going to need to iron out. Having said that, I have continued to maintain that Gonzaga will be between a two and three loss team before the non-conference is over. So something along the lines of 11 and three or 12 and two is kind of where I expect them to be. This is one of the games, the Michigan State game, I should say, is, is one of the games I thought that they could potentially lose. The fact that they did not, especially when they looked like they were going to for a a huge part of the game is a fantastic result for the Zags but with te with Texas with Kentucky with Alabama with the PK 85 with Baylor like that's that's a lot of games that's a lot of, a lot of tough games to win so I think they're going to lose two maybe three of them uh, and what happened against Michigan State hasn't really changed that answer for me all right, we're going to come back in the second segment, and we're going to talk about my favorite development from this game, something that I think is going to be majorly critical for the Zags going forward, and that is minutes from Hunter Salas at the point guard position. But before we do that, I want to tell you all about Upside. From cringing at the pump to getting an eye-popping check at your favorite restaurant, inflation is hitting us all where it hurts, and it really hurts. 
That's why I started using Upside. Upside is an incredible app for anyone who buys gas, groceries, or dines out. With every purchase, I'm earning cash back thanks to Upside. The app is very, very easy to use, and there's no catch. To get started, download the free Upside app. Use my promo code LOCKED, and you'll get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 and up. Next, claim an offer for whatever you're buying on Upside. Check in at the business, pay as usual with a credit card, and get paid. In comparison to credit card rewards or loyalty programs, you can earn three times more cash back with Upside. Upside users are earning more than a million dollars every week. That's part of why they have a 4.8 star rating on the App Store. Download the free Upside app and use promo code LOCKED to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 and up. That's $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 and up using code LOCKED. All right, segment two, still Andy Patton, still Locked on Zags. And I want to thank all of you for making Locked on Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen today, check out Locked on Sports today. From the games that matter the most to the biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights that only Locked on can provide. Locked on Sports today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, segment two. We got plenty more questions to get through here on Locked On Zags Mailbags Monday. This first question comes from Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter, who says, with Nolan sitting during a critical part of the game, should Hunter start over Nolan? Jacob, many other people shared your sentiment. Uh, Urson at E. Demir NBA on Twitter said, do you expect Hunter Salas to get more on-ball reps, and will he eventually start this year? Gas Lamp Victim on Twitter, what do we make of Hickman sitting on the bench during the most critical time of the game? Yeah, so this is the conversation. This is the big story for Gonzaga basketball right now. Nolan Hickman, presumed starting point guard, guy who has kind of passed the mantle away from Andrew Nembhard after his outstanding career in Gonzaga, his now outstanding NBA career for those who haven't been following. He's been exceptional with the Indiana Pacers. But there was kind of some question, is Hickman ready? Is he going to be the guy who's going to step up behind him? Most of the expectation was that the veteran guys, Rasir Bolton, Malachi Smith, both veteran guys, both guys who played point guard at their previous institutions, both guys who could conceivably step into a backup point guard role if needed. However, that's not who's been doing it. Hunter Salas, Mark Few told us, and I should know, Mark Few, when he goes out of his way to mention somebody in a conversation, Usually that's pretty noteworthy, and he went out of his way to mention that Hunter Salas could get reps as they back up point guard. During craziness in the kennel, he mentioned it, and here we are, Michigan State, the final 11 and a half minutes of this game. The Zags ran a lineup that included Hunter Salas, Rasir Bolton, Malachi Smith, Julian Strother, and Drew Timmy. That was the lineup for the last 11 and a half minutes, except for three possessions at the very end of the game when Anton Watson came in defensively. That's it, and in that lineup, Hunter Salas was the guy running the point. He was the guy doing the job. Now, Gonzaga had basically abandoned their ball screen actions entirely. That's what Nolan Hickman and the offense had been attempting to run in the first half. Some of it was Hickman being a little bit sloppy with the basketball. I believe he had four turnovers, missed some shots he shouldn't be taking. Uh, You know, he he had an up and down game. I don't think that Nolan Hickman's performance was disastrous in the way that some people have maybe kind of taken away from it. I think he had some good things and he did some bad things. He's just a little bit raw. He's still kind of finding that role but Salas again without being asked to do as much as Nolan Hickman I think that is an important part of this conversation it doesn't mean that Salas cannot do those things it just means that he wasn't asked to do those things all Gonzaga did in the second half offensively was get the ball down the court and then find a way to get the ball to Drew Timmy that was pretty much it it wasn't exceptionally complicated they could space the floor with the shooting that they had and they had the ability to kind of do some fairly creative things but Pretty much it was get the ball, pass it to a wing player, make an entry pass to Drew Timmy and clear the heck out of the way and let him go to work. What Salas being on the floor in those situations does is it gives Gonzaga more defensive intensity, a player who's more capable of keeping Michigan State's guards in front of him on the defensive end of the floor. He's phenomenal at knocking the ball away and getting steals that way with him and Smith and Bolton. That's a really nice dynamic defensive lineup Uh, offensively because you have Three guys who can really shoot. Salas hasn't proven that he can shoot, and that is a question for him. Again, doesn't mean that he can't. We just haven't seen it yet. We didn't see it last year. We haven't seen it yet this year. But in a lineup where the three, the two, the three, and the four can all hit threes at a 40-plus percent clip, you don't necessarily need your point guard to be an elite three-point shooter. You'd almost rather have a guy who's more capable of getting the ball down the court in a hurry, getting into an offensive set, and playing really, really good defense. And that's kind of what Hunter Salas brings. 
I don't think that this this change by Gonzaga, this decision in the second half, necessarily indicates a wider change for Gonzaga going forward. Certainly, if if Hunter Salas starts over Nolan Hickman against Texas, that's going to tell you a lot. If Hunter Salas plays more minutes than Nolan Hickman against Texas, even if Hickman still starts, that's going to tell you a lot too. And I think that once we see a game that's not played in a very unique situation like this one, we're probably going to have a little bit more data to go off of, a little bit more information. But do I think that Hunter Salas could eventually overtake Nolan Hickman in terms of minutes played at the point guard position? Yes. Do I think he could eventually start over him? Yes. I think both of those things are possible. I don't know how likely, and I don't know how much the coaching staff is really weighing this performance for both players. And again, it's not like Hickman was horrible in this game either. So I think that that's worth noting and worth kind of acknowledging as we look forward to how this team's going to kind of shake out their rotations. But it's hard to it's hard not to think that there's a, a realistic situation where Salas, his playing time bumps up significantly in the, in the coming months and potentially he overtakes uh, as the starting point guard for the Zags. Next question comes from at Goldbloom underscore Matt, who says, what was the secret sauce for our second half turnaround? It's a little similar to the questions that was asked before. Cause he also mentioned the Nolan Hickman, Hunter Salas change. Uh, but honestly, the secret sauce was really Drew Timmy. Uh, it's, it's, it's so simple to just talk about him and, and what he did uh, and, and almost kind of boring in a way, but that's what it was. The Zags just realized, Hey, we have an all American on our team. We have one of the, if not the best low post score in the entire country on our roster. And we're playing a basketball game in a situation where outside shooting is kind of, not something that either team is able to do. Just get him the dang ball. Don't run the normal offense. Don't do the same types of stuff we normally do because Michigan State was packing it in and forcing Gonzaga to shoot threes. Gonzaga's offense relies on looking to score down low first and then taking outside shots if they're available. Michigan State made him available. Gonzaga did what their offense is designed to do and couldn't knock down the shots because of the situation with the game and the wind and everything going down in that capacity so eventually in the second half Gonzaga decided screw it we're just not going to do that anymore we're just going to find a way to get the ball to Drew Timmy and let him work guess what Drew is responsible for Gonzaga's last 18 points and they came back and won that's the secret sauce doesn't have to be more complicated than that next question comes from at Jacob Quarter 2 on Twitter who says if Drew keeps playing like the way he de- he has does he have a chance to win the Wooden Award heck yeah he does absolutely in fact I think he's the front runner I think he might be the front runner right now. He had a, 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 I could be wrong. I believe he had a double double in the second half. If not, he had nine rebounds in the second half, uh, just alone. He was phenomenal in the second half. We've seen him do this before, where he just entirely takes over games. Uh, it's an incredibly incredible skill that he has. Yeah, he has some defensive limitations. Yeah, he still doesn't have the outside shooting, but that's stuff the NBA can worry about in terms of winning the Wooden Award. Absolutely, he's in that conversation. Oscar Shibwe has had the injury stuff. Armando Baycott hasn't looked like himself to start the year exactly. So I think that there's some, some. he might be the, the clear front runner at this point. Hunter Dickinson from Michigan has been incredible. He's been fantastic. So that's a player to watch there. Uh, Marcus Sasser at Houston, Trace Jackson Davis at Indiana, Jaime Hawkes from UCLA, all in the mix as well. Certainly we'll see other players kind of step into that conversation as the year goes on. But right now, Drew Timmy, he keeps doing what Drew Timmy does. There's a very good chance that he ends up taking home that award. Next question comes from at user dad risk on Twitter, who says, when's the last time a single player was this important to a Gonzaga team? And could Gonzaga have fewer than four double digit scores this season? The last time that happened was the 12, 13 season when Kelly Olenek was the star. Yeah. So, I don't think that Drew Timmy is typically going to be this, I don't want to say important because he's obviously very important, but I don't think he'll be as singularly relied upon offensively going forward. I think that that was in part a product of the, of the weird situation when Gonzaga's every other one of Gonzaga's best scorers on this team that isn't Drew Timmy are 40 plus percent three point shooters. Rasir Bolton, 46% last year. Julian Strother, 39% last year. Malachi Smith was over 40% last year at Chattanooga. So, when you have a game where the outside shooting is kind of not a factor, where it's difficult to get those shots to go down and where you're trying to do as little outside shooting as possible, of course you're going to rely upon Drew Timmy. I think it was kind of obvious that that was going to be the situation, and it was kind of why it was frustrating to see Gonzaga take 12 threes in the first half. Like, dude, just give the ball to the dude who's gonna who could win the Wooden Award this year. Like, just give him the ball, let him do it. And Gonzaga was a bit hesitant to do that in the first half. We saw it in the second half. I don't think that that is a 
necessarily what's going to happen for the rest of the year. Is Drew Timmy going to be really, really critical to this team's success? Yes. Is him having a bad game going to be a problem for Gonzaga? Yeah, it has always been a problem for Gonzaga when that happens. But I think that most games going forward, other players will be able to step up in a more significant way, at least offensively, than they were really able to do in this game. And it was why it was so important for Gonzaga to, I mean, he had 18, their last 18 points, he was directly responsible. That's, that's his, this, they only scored 64 points. That's an incredible amount of Gonzaga's offense for him to be responsible for in a row. And so if, I don't think that'll normally be the case, but yeah, he's, he's obviously pretty important. All right, two segments down. We're going to come back in the third and final segment, and we're going to discuss realignment. We're going to discuss Gloria Navarez bouncing from the WCC to the Mountain West, what that means for the WCC, what that means for Gonzaga. But before we do that, our partners at Nissan have worked with us to create a new segment across the Locked On College Network titled Thrilling Moments, where we highlight the most exciting play from the Zags last game or throughout the team's history. The Zags didn't really provide a ton to write home about on Friday against Michigan State, but Drew Timmy straight up dominated in the second half. Like we mentioned, he was responsible for Gonzaga's final 18 points, leading to a big time victory over Tom Izzo's squad. He had multiple reverse lay-ins, some incredible footwork down on the block. The game winning shot was not particularly exciting. Drew Timmy hit a free throw to give Gonzaga a 64 64 three lead with a minute and a half left. Neither team scored in the final two minutes of the game and Gonzaga went home to victory. This segment has been inspired by thrilling new designs featured across Nissan's new lineup of vehicles. Pursue what thrills you in the all new Frontier, Armada, or Pathfinder today. Available now at NissanUSA.com. All right, segment three, still Andy Patton, still locked on Zag, still hammering through Mailbag Monday here, processing the Michigan State-Gonzaga game, and now kind of turning our attention to the other news that hit the WCC. This question comes from John via Gmail. He says, list the top three aspects that Gonzaga needs to improve upon if they want to make a deep run in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, so the first thing is the ball screen defense. We kind of talked about that a little bit in the Tennessee game where it was particularly bad. It looked much better against North Florida, but you know that's North Florida. It's something that you'd expect it to be better in that situation. And then it looked very bad in the first half against Michigan state. And that was frustrating because that's kind of the main thing you need to stop in that game. You, you, you know that the outside shooting is going to be difficult. You know that Michigan state is going to have a hard time knocking down those threes. So how can you let their guards get to the rim as easily as Gonzaga did in the first half? It is a big issue for the Zag, something that is going to absolutely need to be cleaned up, whether it's a personnel change, kind of goes back to the Hunter Salas conversation, whether it is a schematic change, whatever it may be, that is something that needs to change. Number two is rim protection. And again, it kind of goes with the ball screen defense. If you're letting guards get free run towards the basket, it puts a lot more pressure on your rim protectors to do their job. And Gonzaga doesn't have a lot of real rim protection on the roster. Efton Reed is a load. He is a big, strong, physical dude, but he hasn't learned how to play within Gonzaga's defensive schemes without fouling. We've seen, we saw some great instances. He had a couple, uh, a couple blocks, a couple really nice instances of keeping his hands up and playing really, really good defense. But he's he's just a work in progress. That's all it is. He's just a work in progress. So for now, for for Gonzaga, they don't have a ton of rim protection, and when they're also struggling on ball screens. That creates a situation where opposing guards who are very, very good can, can put a lot of points on the board in a hurry. And then, of course, we touched on this a bunch already, so I won't spend too long on it, but consistent play from the point guard position. Whether it's Nolan Hickman improving dramatically and getting to bump up to 28, 30 minutes per game, whether it's Hunter Salas stepping into that role, whether it's the combo of those two guys and potentially some minutes for Malachi Smith and Rasir Bolton kind of getting into a spot where the point guard play this season is not something that we're worrying about night in and night out. Next question comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, what should we take from the news that the Mountain West has just hired WCC Commissioner Gloria Navarez to be the Mountain West Commissioner? With respects to Mountain West League membership, she has already said the Mountain West will be aggressive and innovative. Seems clear to me this means the Mountain West is going to take an aggressive run at getting Gonzaga to join. Not alone in that thought, Jeff, Upper95215 on Twitter asked, does Gloria being the Mountain West Commissioner increase the odds of the Zags moving to the Mountain West? No, I do I just don't see it. I will be honest. I don't see it. I don't think Gonzaga is going to the Mountain West. I don't think Gloria going to the Mountain West is going to move the needle there. Do I think that Gloria and the Mountain West leadership is going to try to get Gonzaga to join the conference? Hell yeah, they better. She's not doing her job if that's not what she's doing. Look, San Diego State's probably going to the Pac-12. It's not confirmed. 
It has been rumored. It has been reported as something that is being discussed. It has also seen some of those reports indicate that the initial report was perhaps premature. Regardless, there are very, very few people out there who don't think that San Diego State to the Pac-12 is going to happen. So now you have a Mountain West conference without San Diego State. It's just not that strong of a basketball conference without them. It's still a decent basketball conference. Wyoming has been nice. Boise State, we've seen them kind of tick up. UNLV has great history. Fresno State has some solid history. But by and large, it's not a dramatic increase from the pack, excuse me, from the WCC. You could argue that it is an uptick, especially with the WCC not having BYU. And I think that that's a reasonable argument. And I, I don't think anybody would really argue against that necessarily. But Gonzaga has their eyes set on something much bigger than that. Gonzaga wants the Big 12. Gonzaga wants the Pac-12. Gonzaga, if they had the opportunity to get in the SEC or the Big 10, you bet they would take that too. I don't know that those are opportunities that are going to be presented to them necessarily, but the Big 12 is at least considering it. The Pac-12 is certainly considering it. So for Gonzaga, I don't think the Mountain West moves the needle for him very much. Mostly, I just don't think if Gonzaga is going to make a move, they're going to make a move to a Power 5 program. They're going to make a move to the Pac-12 or the Big 12 because those are the most likely options for them. I just, I don't think Gonzaga, because they don't want to make multiple moves. They don't want to do this again. They don't want to, you know, they want to do this once and then be done with it for a very long time. And for me, if if they think the Big 12 or the Pac-12 are even have a, a at all opportunity for them to potentially join, there's no chance they're going to join the Mountain West because I think that effectively kills it. All right. Next question comes from at strike nowhere on Twitter, who says is Gloria Navarez's departure an ill omen for the WCC. Yeah. I think anytime leadership changes, it's something to keep an eye on. Certainly you, you just go through a, a change period. You go through a kind of an uncomfortableness. A Gloria has been there for quite a long time. She's done a lot of really great things in the WCC. She's obviously helped with the Orleans arena and, and the, the movement to have the WCC tournament in Las Vegas. Uh, she helped bring BYU in. It's unfortunate that BYU was leaving, but had a big role in that. So I, I think for, for the WCC, this is a loss, but it's hard to say. I'm not any more concerned about the WCC than I was prior to Gloria, to, prior to Gloria's departure. However, I was already kind of concerned about the WCC. BYU leaving and Gonzaga making it pretty clear that they want to leave is a massive, massive thing for the WCC. If, they, if there's a WCC without those two programs and they cannot replace them with programs that really move the needle, if they replace them with Grand Canyon and Seattle U, for example, both nice programs, both decent basketball, decent mid-major basketball programs that I think don't get very much love, but they are not Gonzaga and BYU. They are not even close to Gonzaga and BYU. So... If that's what you're left with, it's a worse conference. It's a significantly worse conference. And it, I don't think that it spells the end of the WCC at all. I think the WCC is still is a fine, fully functional conference that's going to continue to exist and, and be okay. But they're going to lose money. They're going to lose some of the stuff that, that, that Gonzaga has helped provide for them and that BYU has helped provide for them. So they're, they're in a pretty tenuous spot right now. And leadership changing over is not a great sign. But I don't think that it's like a super significantly... Uh, concerning development, not any more so than the other developments that are happening in the WCC. All right, final question of the show. This one comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, while they did not win on Friday night, does BYU's performance against San Diego State, where BYU led for all but the last four minutes of the game, change your perception on what kind of season BYU will have this year? It's too bad BYU was not able to hold on and win that one. Yeah, it was a nice performance for BYU, no doubt. Uh, they looked good. Uh, they got more performance, more scoring from their guards, more balanced scoring, obviously putting up 82 points against, or excuse me, 75 points against San Diego State. When they scored 60 points against Idaho State, you love to see that development for BYU. Having said that, no, I'm, I'm not super high on BYU still. This didn't change the equation for me all that much. They took 26 threes in this game and made nine of them. That's about 34%. That's not awful. But you can't be that reliant on the three. 26 threes in this game. You, you can't be that reliant on the outside shot. Rudy Williams is supposed to be their kind of Alex Barcelo replacement. He just hasn't been that guy yet. He's a transfer from Coastal Carolina. Scored like 16 points per game for them. He went one for five in this game from deep. He scored, I think he scored 15 points. So he had an okay performance in general. But he's, he's not knocking down the outside shots. They haven't really found anybody to do that for him consistently. In this game, their bench scored a total of 13 points. They don't have the depth. They don't have the star power. 
I made the prediction that they'll be in the bottom half of the BYU, and I should clarify that that was a bold, bold prediction. I labeled it as such. Uh, I think that there's a pretty, you know, that, that would be surprising to most. It would be a little surprising to me as well. But I'm not sure that they're a top four team. I think they're fourth, fifth. They're kind of right in that range. Maybe they can sneak into third, but I, I'm, I have my concerns about this team. And even though they played well against a good San Diego State team, it hasn't really made many of those concerns go away for me yet. All right, that's going to do it for me today. Plenty more coming this week. We got Texas on Wednesday, of course, Kentucky on Sunday. So lots of previews for those games. Also, check out my new podcast, Locked on College Basketball, a national show all about college hoops with myself and co-host Isaac Shade of Locked on Tar Heels. Available wherever you get podcasts, available on YouTube as well. Go hit that subscribe button if you haven't done so yet. Finally, thank you for making Locked On Zags your first listen of the day. For your second listen, check out the Locked On Sports Today podcast. The biggest stories of the day plus instant reactions, big game recaps, and the take of the day. Available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get podcasts. All right, thank you all for listening, and go Zags.